Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text upon which we base our meditation today is the Gospel lesson, and I'd like to read it in about a minute or two. Dear friends in Christ, as I traveled across the nation, something I was able to still do every day, part of my routine, was that when it was Lynn's turn to drive, I was able to get out my meditations. So I kept up with my daily meditation, and then I'd pull out my phone so I could get my Bible on that, except when you're in certain parts of Montana and North Dakota where it don't work. So we had to wait till we were to the motel or something, and then I got out my Wisconsin Lutheran quarterly and kept up with almost my Forward in Christ, and I'd have my daily routine down, maybe get a nap in before it was my turn to drive again. And as I'm coming back, it was like, when am I going to get my sermon done? Because it's Saturday and I'll just be back here for one day. Well, I mean, that was a no-brainer. I was working on all, I've been working on all week. Through Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana. So get ready for a long one. Because <laughs> that's a lot of time to prepare one sermon. I was looking at the, the, the meditations and how they fit in with this part of God's Word today. Looking at what was in Ezekiel. This, I mean, not Ezekiel, but with Elisha in 2 Kings, what was, just, what was dealt with in meditations from last Sunday till yesterday. And as he was dealing with just a simple miracle, very simple miracle, that a man came from Baal Shalashah, bringing the man of God, Elisha, 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said, because this man had brought it to Elisha and maybe some of his close friends. And his response was, how can I set this before a hundred men? His servant asked. But Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some leftover. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some leftover, according to the word of the Lord. And then the Old Testament lesson today is going to be the week of devotions this coming week. Only, as you saw on the back of the bulletin, except it said certain types of verses. It didn't give you the whole text. Because there are certain things that I want to highlight that were left out on the back of the bulletin today. Because the basic stuff there is, again, they're hungry, they're thirsty, they've run out of basically what they brought from Egypt already, and now they just either want to die and go, or go back. And so God provides the quail in the evening, and he invents something that they end up calling manna, because the Hebrew word for what is it is manna. So actually they called it what is it. For all 40 years they called what is it. Manna. But it left out the verses where they didn't do exactly what they were supposed to. I mean, you could have assumed that, couldn't you? When they were told the basic directions, the basic recipe every day, was gather, and the Bible tells us an omer, which is what he calls a small bucket. Get a small bucket for every person in your family every morning. Don't gather too much. Don't gather too little. That's what you're supposed to do six days a week. And then on the sixth day of the week, well actually five days a week you do that. Five days a week you do that because on the sixth day you're supposed to gather two buckets for every person because I'm not going to give you any on the Sabbath day. So whatever you have on the sixth day has to last two days because I'm not providing anything on the seventh day. That's a day of rest. Those are the instructions. There's no asterisk. There's no turn to page eight. They're not in a foreign language. They're in the language of the people. That's the basic stuff. You think they followed it? I mean, even if we had to guess, we would know they would, somebody had to mess up. Well, the Bible tells us they did. They just did. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of you. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord. And then say to the entire community, These are the instructions. I've heard the grumbling. This is what I'm going to do. It's the bread God has given you. And the Israelites did they were, as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And while they measured by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. And no one is to keep it, any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. 
And each morning everyone gathered as much as he needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much, the two omers for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake, and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it till morning. So they saved it until morning. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they didn't find any. Is God hard to understand? Is, are his instructions, the words that he gives us in the Bible, subject to interpretation? Because that's what people say. The Bible's hard to understand, uh, subject to interpretation. Uh, we don't really know how to be saved. I've heard that actually said to me. I, the Bible doesn't really tell me how to be saved. And it's like, you are kidding me. You're just plain kidding me. I mean, can I repeat just simple verse like John 3.16? Can I repeat stuff from Ephesians? God doesn't know. God doesn't tell us exactly. God didn't tell them exactly about what the s things they were supposed to do with the man. Yes, he did. But they still needed to do it their own way. And that's why I look at the gospel lesson today. I reminded the fact that as I think about these other things that were presented, at the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus fed 5,000 families with five small barley loaves. Not as many as even Elisha had for feeding 100 people. But five small barley loaves, two small fish. Anybody remember the, how many baskets of leftovers there were? One per disciple, 12 of them. More leftovers than they had started with. Elisha had a miracle with barley loaves and feeding a hundred people. Jesus has a miracle with thousands of people and even has more leftovers. What happened next is that Jesus sent the disciples on ahead of him to get to the other side of the lake, but he decided to stay on this side and pray for a while. But then he catches up by walking on the water and catching up to them and hopping in the boat and going the rest of the way. So the people wondered where, what had happened to Jesus because only one boat had left and they didn't see him in it, so how did he get over there? And that's where we pick up in the Gospel today. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign will you give that we may see at, and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And that's where your text ends at the end of the bulletin. But unfortunately, this is the next verse. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you not, do not believe. Are you proud to be a human in the human race? I'm not really one. I'm an alien. You, you are all humans, and the people I read about in the newspapers are humans. People I see on TV are humans. People I see on reality TV shows, no, I don't watch them, but I can't help but see the commercials while I'm trying to watch my real show. Even when I'm watching Blue Bloods, they stick in that other junk from time to time. It reminds me, I must be an alien because I don't want to be a human being. Human beings are stupid, and I don't want to be one of them. Can't figure out a simple recipe. Collect manna for six days. It's not going to be there on the seventh day. Don't collect too much and be lazy. Get up every morning. Do your job. Telling Jesus what to do. Give us a sign. 
loaves of bread, fish, they're stuffed, and the leftovers are still there. The other things he did to show people his love and his compassion, but they didn't, he didn't do it the way they wanted it at the time they wanted it. Yes, we haven't changed. At the time of Moses, the times of Jesus, and today, the human race still wants God to be the servant. He's supposed to be the magic genie that answers our prayers whenever we're in need, but gets back in the bottle and not tell us what to do whenever we don't want him to. We pray when we're in need of help, but don't he, he should not dare to tell us how to live our lives, what we should do on a regular basis, how we should live, how we should treat other people, not be greedy, not be selfish, not get involved with sexual sins. No, don't tell us what to do. You just keep serving us whenever we need stuff. That is God's job, according to the human race. It was that way at the time of Moses. It was that way at the time of Jesus, and it's that way today. Jesus is kind of blunt when he says, I didn't come here to do this for you. And yet, can't we find other passage that Jesus tells us he came to serve us? He came to be here for us and to deal with our greatest needs. I mean, during Lent, we highlight just a simple act where Jesus gets on his hands and knees and washes the disciples' feet to show that he's a servant. At Wisconsin Lutheran College, they have a statue of this, of Jesus on his knees, washing one of the disciples' feet. To remind the students as they go to Wisconsin Lutheran College that we are trying to teach you how to be servants like our Lord and our Savior. Jesus does, did come here to serve us. He did come to save us. And he did get that job done when he died on the cross. What Jesus doesn't like is being told how we're supposed, how he's supposed to serve us. That's what he got annoyed at with this crowd. He wanted to serve them. He wanted to help them. He wanted this, him to see him as their savior. And they're just worried about something. What's the next meal? When's he going to give the next food or the next thing they want? And God saw that in the Old Testament too. There were times when the people grumbled. And God just gives them. They, they grumble about the food, grumble they want to be back, they'd rather be dead, be best slaves again. And God simply says, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll give them meat at night, give them bread in the morning, and then they can add that to the other stuff they already have. But if you've ever read that section of the Old Testament, there were times when God had had enough too. He said, enough. And yes, poisonous snakes were sent. And other things happened from time to time because he got tired. The grumbling about what they really needed sometimes turned into the complaining and whining about stuff that they thought God was not helping them with. They wanted more than the basics. They wanted the luxuries. And if God didn't help them, then he wasn't a good God. Jesus is dealing with this with the people there too. And I've certainly heard it in my life, tragically from time to time. Not in a funny way, when people say, I don't worship God anymore because of this thing that happened in my life 10 years ago. Or I don't go to church anymore because of this thing that happened five years ago in my life. God let me down, he mustn't be there, it's really hard for me to believe in him. And usually when they tell me that, it's usually something real. It's not like they didn't like what cookies were served at the coffee hour. It's not that they didn't like certain color of the furniture in the church or something like that. They quit. It is because they lost a loved one because something happened in their life and now they're crippled. It was something that was real. It wasn't something I could mock and just say, poo poo, why are you so you know, hung up on something like that? But at the same time, I tried to help them understand, don't let the devil get you. Don't let the devil get you with his number one temptation. The number one temptation that he already used in the Garden of Eden. God doesn't love you. If he loved you, he'd let you do this. If he loved you, he'd give you this. If he loved you, this wouldn't have happened. Jesus didn't come to fix the planet. He didn't come to remove the effects of sin here on this earth. He came to deal with the consequences of sin for our immortal immortality, our lives. And that's where the trust comes in. 
And that's why it is sometimes hard to follow him. Not because he's hard to understand, but because sometimes he doesn't always fix things the way we want them fixed. And I know I need to remind myself of that too. God does not want, God does not want to serve me at my direction, at my command, at my whim. I need to remind myself he's God. I'm one of his creatures. But God does want to serve me. And he has. He has served me. I know where I get to go for eternity. And I don't know all the details about how wonderful that place is going to be, but my trust factor is pretty good on that it's going to be better than this place. My trust factor is pretty good by the hints he gives me throughout his word that it's going to be a place I'd like to live for the rest of my life. To be sort of on eternal vacation without trying to drive 700 miles a day to get somewhere else. And the cell phone service works even when you're on Highway 200S in Montana trying to avoid the fires around Glacier National Park. All those are dumb little things. But I tell myself that too. God has given me the stuff that I really need. The simple childlike faith that he loves me. He knows who I am. And he loves me. And he's forgiven me my sins. And he doesn't demand that I serve him. You know, even in the Ephesians reading today, he doesn't demand that we serve him. But he says, I've done all this for you. I've loved you. i cared for you. Do you want to help yourself have a happier life while you're here on this earth? You want to have a happier life and be full every day? Then pick up the manna on the days you're supposed to pick it up and don't pick it up on the days it's not there. You'll be happy. Take a day off every week. That was the Sabbath. They weren't commanded to do terrible things, tough things on the Sabbath day. It was take rest. What's the word Sabbath mean? Rest. It's called the rest day. Like rest area along the freeway. Take a break. You know what it's like to have to go to the bathroom and it says rest area and as you get close it says closed? Next rest area, 90 miles? It's terrible when you're allowed to drink Mountain Dew while you're on your trip. And the next one's open, you go, yay, thank God. Dumb stuff. Dumb stuff. But those little things made me think about the other stuff. How God is really good to me. And he doesn't demand a lot. He my parents baptized me. I was able to baptize my daughters. God said, do that. That it was sort of like a commandment. Go baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'll adopt whoever you baptize into my family. So they're now in the will. Today again, we're going to do the Lord's Supper. Sort of a commandment. Take eight. Take drink. Tough commandments. Do this often in remembrance of me. It's not a commandment. Like some law. It's a gift. Take, eat this. Here, drink this. I only gave five pounds. I only gave five pounds in the weeks that there. Because people kept telling me, here, drink this. Here, eat this. And I did. So it's back to Cocoa Krispies this morning. Start getting that back off. But God says, take eat, take drink for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. And he says, worship me because your souls will be freshed. Read the Bible because your souls will be nourished. And I thought of that with something in a different way for the first time because I've always thought of this that when I take the wafer and I drink the cup of wine that I know that this is good for my soul. I know it nourishes my faith. I know it also helps the Holy Spirit because he, he works through the Bible and he works through the sacraments, what we call the means of grace in catechism class. He works through these things to make my faith stronger. But I thought of it a different way this time too because I talked to somebody who, we were, you know, as we sit down with us, my classmates all got old in the last 34 years. It was amazing to see them. Tragic how some of them look after this much time. Some of them have gone bald and are wearing glasses. So we also compared medication, like all good people who have turned 60 or about to turn 60. One guy had an organ transplant, and so he has to take a special drug every day. 
So that his body does not reject that. And I thought of that with this too. Not only does this nourish me, not only does this help build up my faith and my soul, but I also can use it as an anti-rejection drug because it helps me not reject the foreign object of the Holy Spirit in my body. Because Satan's working on that. Satan's working on that. He doesn't want to be, be, be part of God's family and he doesn't want me to trust God and he doesn't want me to love God for what he's loved me for. And it works both ways. It helps me keep that foreign object in me and it strengthens that foreign object in me. And so this morning, I would ask you to do three little things. Because that's what I'm going to do this morning when I take the Lord's Supper. Remind yourself, God loves you when you take this. God loves you. Your sins are forgiven. And you're going to heaven. Amen. Please arise. May the love of God, which he has for you and for me, and which goes beyond our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds focused on Christ Jesus. Amen.